Thank you for joining us today. I am Justin McNaughton and joining me is Sharon Urias. We uh, do this monthly webinar called You, Me and IP. And every, every month we pick a different topic in intellectual property. Today, Sharon is actually joining us as play, role playing an executive from Vandalay Industries where she used to work with George Costanza. So we're gonna be talking about, um, we're gonna be talking about customs and border protection and how to use that to stop infringing goods. So uh, as we've mentioned before in some of our prior uh, webinars, I am primarily a, a, an intellectual property prosecutor, meaning that I help clients to secure and register intellectual property. And Sharon is a litigator and helps clients fight about intellectual property. So today, just to give you some context, uh, Customs and Border Patrol in 2020 seized about 1.4 or $1.3 billion worth of infringing goods and stopped somewhere in the ballpark of 26,500 shipments of infringing goods into the United States. Um, you know, in, in the year before that, Customs and Border also arrest, uh, facilitated the arrest of several hundred people and, uh, and the conviction of um, 
I think 150 people just related to intellectual property crimes in the United States. So, and then for context, um, in 2019, about two thirds of all seized goods originated from China. So, so it's a, it's an interesting, this is an interesting kind of part of intellectual property that doesn't get a, a lot of attention, but it's a very important one. It can, it can be a valuable tool to, uh, to people as you're building your brand, as you're importing your own products and you're stopping um, cheap knockoffs from coming into the country. So yeah, that's, Jared, that's, maybe if you talk. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's another tool in the intellectual property owner's toolbox to protect their intellectual property interests. Because we all know that if you allow infringement to occur, then it's going to weaken and it could even cause you to lose your rights in your trademarks. So first, once you have, you have to, in order to register with CBP or Customs and Border Protection, you need to first have a registration with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So once you have your trademark registration, you're going to want to march over to CBP and register your trademark with that office as well. And Justin will talk a little bit later into this webinar about how you go about getting the CBP registration. But essentially, once your trademark is registered with CBP, then CBP has the authority to detain, seize, forfeit, and even destroy um, counterfeit merchandise seeking entry into the United States, or if it's just merchandise seeking entry into the United States that bears an infringing trademark or copyright as well, although this webinar really focuses on trademark. Um, and in fact, CBP will even enforce uh, trademark rights on its own without any initiation from the trademark owner. So if your mark is registered with the USPTO, and it's registered with CBP, and there is a searchable electronic database that CBP uses, um, then CBP is authorized to um, take action at the border and stop the importation of these infringing goods. Um, Sharon, let's talk a bit about what, what a counterfeit good is before we go on to the rest of that, because I think it might be helpful yeah. to the, and, and also before I forget, we're going we're gonna to try to talk for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll answer questions. So if you, as you have questions, if you just put them into the Q&A, we will come back and grab all those questions at the end. So um, I forgot to mention that at the beginning. So, so counterfeit, counterfeit trademarks, um, sounds, it sounds like a thing, um, it is but, a it, thing. but it is a thing, but it doesn't really, like most people don't know exactly what it is. And it's actually a statutory thing. A counterfeit trademark means that you have a, somebody has a registration for a trademark and then somebody else is duplicating that on goods. And that gives it a special designation as counterfeit as opposed to just infringing. So right. and the and reason people, counterfeit is- I was just gonna say that people often think of the, the a simple example is, you know, on, on the streets of New York City, you buy a knockoff Rolex watch. That's a counterfeit uh, Rolex. Right. right, and because they are, in, they are it's not just that they're, being cutesy about it, they're trying to pass off a, something as exactly the, the original. Um, and counterfeit trademark use triggers criminal as well as civil uh, penalties. And so that's why it's a little bit different. So the, the Customs and Border, they are charged with dealing with counterfeit. When it gets into, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, lesser infringements, um, it's it's you know, they still have authority, but they, they rely on the public to kind of register and help them find those. So um, I just thought that was a useful designation as we get into this and why it's important. So I agree. And, and so, you know, to that point, CBP has the authority um, to actually arrest people who try to import counterfeit goods. And the reality is, unless, you know, it's a large volume or it's a repeat offender, it's probably not going to happen. But they do have the authority to do that. And as you said, in, in 2019, um, over 150 people were just were convicted. So the, the, the other thing is that the registration with CBP becomes a collaborative process. So they will work with the trademark owners. And um, I saw yesterday, Justin, that Nike and CB, that CBP announced just yesterday that it has a collaboration with Nike 
where Nike is donating proprietary technology to CBP to help authenticate Nike goods um, and to help stop their importation into the United States, which not only helps protect Nike's interests, but it also protects the public because consumers who are buying Nikes want to make sure that the goods that they're buying and they're paying money for um, actually are authentic goods and they're not counterfeits originating from China or from somewhere else um, in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So, and it, you know, you start to think about how difficult this problem is because you have, you have companies importing from multiple countries, multiple manufacturers through multiple ports in the United States and different categories of goods. If you think about, to use your Nike example, if you think about how many different types of goods that Nike sells, the task of figuring out which of all the Nike stuff that enters the United States on a single day, which ones are real and which ones aren't, is a daunting task. And so that's why as part of the registration process, it is kind of a collaborative, like you, part of the application is you tell the Customs and Border Protection Agency what it is that they, sh they should be looking for. So it kind of move into some of these registration requirements. Like Sharon said, the first one is you, ha you have to have a registered US trademark and it has to be on the principal register. So it can't be, um, it can't be a supplemental register and it can't be anything that's common law. You, you have to have um, a valid US registration. Then you have to go over and you basically, what you're doing is you're taking that federal registration and you're recording it at, the, at CBP. And it costs $190, which as I said earlier, I think is one of the best deals and, um, that there is in, in IP enforcement. And you, you only need to renew it when you renew your trademark. So it's $190 every, typically every 10 years. Um, and then at that point, you're class of goods, right, Justin? Yeah, you're, that's that's a that's a great point. So it's per class of goods. So, you know, typically, if you're thinking of each trademark or each class or type of goods as a different trademark, then you'll need to register if you have ten different types of goods and ten different classes, so ten different trademark registrations. You may need to register ten times for them to catch every class. But, um, and then what's going to happen is as part of that application. So copyright first copyrights are similar. You've got to have a valid copyright registration. Um, and then you, you'll take that copyright registration and you'll go record it with CBP, pay your $190. And for the, for copyright registrations, you only have to renew those every 20 years. Um, but one of the things you're going to do in your, in, when you record it is you're going to tell customs and border protection, like where you typically are importing from and who your importers are, which helps them because then as they you know, are checking these manifests as things come in, they say, oh, this isn't on the list. This isn't one of those. And so then they'll reach out to you to say like, hey, we have this, it's trying to pass the border. It doesn't look like one of your importers. It doesn't look like your country of origin. They're usually using, is it, is it valid? Um, and, and it is sometimes, I guess, and Sharon, you can talk a bit about it, seizure, but before you do that, it is sometimes, like, this is one of the things where you, you really do want to get a handle on your business before you do this registration, because what's going to happen, and I've seen this happen, where an agent is going to call, and remember, these agents are essentially police officers. I mean, they are police officers. Um, they're going to call, and they're going to say, hey, I have, um, in here, I have, you know, 10,000 of this, it has this sticker on it or has this marking on it. It's this type of goods and it can't, and it's designated as having come from this country. Is it yours? And, and often what will happen if people aren't prepared is then you have this scramble through marketing and through acquisition, whoever to find out like, who, what is, what are we supposed to have coming into and in, in which port is it supposed to be coming into? Is this an importer that they use? Who is, you know, sometimes it's not you that's importing it. Sometimes the factory has hired an importer. And so you just need to know all this stuff because the, because CBP is going to want to know really quickly, is it yours? And if you're wrong, <laughs> you can accidentally destroy a whole lot of your own goods. So 
And so it's a good idea to have a designated employee in charge of interfacing with CBP. And it's typically the person who's in charge of the intellectual property um, portfolio, but it's certainly a part of the portfolio that you wanna make sure is properly managed um, and that you do have a designated point of contact. Um, so what CBP will do um, is, you know, these, these counterfeit goods come to the border, CBP seizes and detains them. And there are three types of goods that CBP will stop from coming in as infringing goods. And the first one we talked about, the counterfeit marks, and those are the fakes, the knockoffs um, of trademarked goods. Um, the second is more of a, I would call it close call. They're not counterfeit goods, but they are copying um, somebody else's trademark. So again, um, using the Nike example, somebody tries to bring in goods. They're, they're not fake Nikes, but they have a, um, they're a mark that is very similar to Nike. That, that may not be a good example because Nike is so famous, but the point is they're a mark that closely resembles a recorded mark. So it's likely to cause consumer confusion. And that's where CBP does have authorization to make a substantive determination. They will actually look at the goods and determine whether or not they think they're infringing. And if they are, then they will stop them from coming in. If they are not, then they will allow them to go through. And then the third category is what are referred to as gray market goods, which is such a large topic that we could don't, um, dedicate an entire webinar just to that. Um, particular topic, but Justin, why don't you just give just a real brief overview of what gray market goods are and why that um, can be an issue with respect to, to this um, particular topic? Sure. So gray market goods are, are typically, they're unlike counterfeit. They're, they're real. They're, they're produced by um, an authorized manufacturer, but they're typically produced for sale only in Japan or only for sale in Europe. And then somebody else is, is importing them from an authorized market into the United States as on, but they're not authorized for import. So it gets really, really, it can get really wild because as you can imagine, usually the manufacturer or not the manufacturer, usually the brand owner wants those products in different markets for different, for, for, good reasons and they may be labeled differently, that kind of thing. So, so that one is, is one, again, you have a whole topic on this, but, but typically there are some instances where, where CBP will stop those goods, but they're a lot of the times you cannot stop those goods because they are actually authorized. They were, they were actually created and sold by the brand owner. The only issue is, is whether they're in the right, the same country where they were um, authorized. So, so in those cases, the, the brand owner usually has to get involved because um, customs board is only going to stop those if, um, you know, if it's a different owner in the foreign country than in the U.S. country. So it really is two different entities, or if there's some material difference where for some regulatory reason, the product has some other feature that's not permitted in the US or something like that. So it, those get pretty fact specific, but, uh, um, but yeah, so, so gray markets are a little bit, a little bit weird, but, um, but primarily they're looking for these counterfeit and these infringing goods when they come through. And in fact, CBP still has authority to seize counterfeit goods, even if they are not recorded with CBP, although they may not be sort of attuned to look for those goods if they're not recorded with CBP. So Given you know the the ease to get the recordation, it's really I think it would be um, foolish not to record your goods if you are involved in the import export business. Um, so uh, you know, like Vandalay Industries, um, CBP so, will also detain. So Sharon, what about what about like you know I'm say I'm I'm on vacation and I pick up um, some sunglasses. And I'm bringing those in. So technically, I'm an importer. I'm bringing those into the United States, and it turns out that they are not the uh, Oakleys, since those are the ones you see a lot. They are not actually Oakley glasses. Like, what what happens there? Well, there is a personal exemption. Um, so what that is is an exemption for personal use. 
only one item, one counterfeit item can be brought into the United States every 30 days. So whether it's sunglasses or you bring in, you know, your fake Rolex that you find um, abroad that you think is just too good to pass up because it looks so real, um, you, are, you are allowed to bring that into the United States as long as you're not bringing it in to sell it. Um, and you only do that once every 30 days. So that's just a little bit, it's called a personal exemption. Um, so, that's you, by CBP. so you have to live with the personal shame, but it's unlikely that you're going to get like arrested at the airport. That's okay. right. So you won't have right, the legal consequences. You'll just have the moral consequences. Um, got, if it, got it. Right. And, and this so, also, by the way, this seizure and detention of goods also applies to copyrighted um, goods. So if there are pirated copies of you know, someone's trying to, to bring in a whole bunch of counterfeit CDs, for example, or um, DVDs, those also will be seized at the border um, if they are produced and um, an attempt to import them is made without the authorization of the copyright owner. So um, that's, uh, that's on the copyright side. <clears throat> so how, what is really the process, um, Justin, that, that CBP goes through um, in order to confirm the authenticity? I mean, we did talk about that a little bit, that CBP may literally just pick up the phone and call the trademark owner. Um, but is there more to the process than that? Yeah, well, they, um, so yeah, there's a lot more to it, but they, they're, they're screening everything that comes in. And so as they screen things, they're looking for ir irregularities and you know, things that don't quite look like they're, they're proper. Um, and typically, if you're registered, they're going to reach out because they're going to have a list when you, when you register. And, and by the way, one of the things you can do, and this is kind of cool, is when you register, you can actually give, you can actually give the border protection agency kind of a, a, a almost like a style guide, like a, like an enforcement guide that they have in their records that's like hey these are the types of things to look like to look for to know that it's actually our goods like here's what here's some indicia that will you know can tell you if it's ours or not and so so cbp will actually look at those things when they're making their determination and as well as like the things that are in your registration to find out if just basically like oh hmm, that's weird oh that's weird okay this may be counterfeit because not everything is the way that it should be in this application. And then what they have, they will make a determination. Okay, we're going to detain these goods and do an investigation. When they do that, they've got five days to tell the importer, hey, we're detaining these. And then they've got 30 days where they detain them and they basically do this investigation. And, and it's kind of um, in, it's, it's kind of up to the importer to prove that it can come in at that stage. But at the same time, CUP reaches out to the trademark owner, sometimes through registered counsel or who, you know, whoever's, whoever's the contact person to, to really verify, okay, are these, you know, is this a shipment you're expecting? Is this supposed to be coming from that place from these people? And then, and it's a very time-driven thing. So they're going to call and it's, and they're going to want to know an answer really quickly. And then then it's up to the trademark owner to give them a recommendation like, oh, we think those are fine, let them through, or no, we can't find record that that should be one of our things. Um, you can, so then they'll, they will detain those. Um, you know, in some instances, the trademark owner can get, like they'll send the trademark owner a sample if you need to check them, but you've got to post bond and, and that kind of thing. So it gets a little bit complicated, but in the end, if the importer doesn't obtain the release, CBP seizes the goods. Um, and then interesting, I thought this was interesting, but and I didn't, I didn't actually realize this. Once they seize those goods and they go through the forfeiture pro proceedings, they will often, um, so either they destroy all the goods, which is massive, or, or they'll get permission from the trademark owner to like obliterate all the trademarks and like they can use them for the government or or they can donate them to charity, which I thought was kind of interesting. That's kind um, of an interesting to do, you know. Yeah. So they seize a bunch of, you know, counterfeit sneakers to donate them to a charity. That would be a nice. Right. I, I was a little concerned if they're seizing a whole bunch of counterfeit electronics and then deploying them in the federal government. But yeah, that's probably you know, not hopefully, a good hopefully somebody's thinking that through. 
Um, so anyway, but the, the whole point of the registration is to kind of foster some collaboration where where CVP knows they can reach out to someone and ask questions about these and make better informed decisions before they um, accept or reject goods. So maybe, so we've got a few minutes left and then we can do some questions and answers. And again, if people have questions and answers, please put them into the Q and A. Yeah. Um, but, you and, know, uh, but let's talk about some of the remedies. Yeah, because trademark owners, especially if this happens a lot, if they're repeat offenders, um, they're gonna want some satisfaction out of this. They wanna know what is available to me in order to stop this from continuing or for me to get some kind of compensation for it. And so under the Tariff Act, um, one of the remedies that a trademark owner or an intellectual property owner can do is go to the ITC, which stands for International Trade Commission, and they can um, initiate a proceeding there. And they can't get monetary damages from the ITC proceedings, but what they can get are orders either um, excluding altogether or limiting um, the importation of infringing goods into the United States. So th the reason that might be appealing to um, a trademark owner is that that can be a faster process than going to court because Yes, it's you, you always have the option of going to say a federal court and filing a lawsuit, you can get an order an injunction um, stopping the importation of the goods, you can also get damages. But the um, proceeding what's called a section 337 proceeding is a, is a much more expeditious way to get um, the exclusion order, the ITC can also initiate an order, uh, excuse me, an action in court um, to get um, you know, permanent relief. Um, there are penalties also that are available if somebody violates an ITC order, although those those penalties will be paid to the government. They're not going to be paid to you um, if they import the um, infringing goods in violation of an order um, preventing them from, from doing so. So uh, there's also forfeiture, which is available. And, and, and so there are all these remedies that are available that are even outside the court process, which I think are a good alternative that people are not always um, knowledgeable about. And for context, though, you know, you'd mentioned that, you know, so if you go to a traditional court, you know, you can get damages and all these sorts of remedies. If you do these, the trade commission route, you can't get those. But, but honestly, a lot of times you're using that route because it's faster and your, your chances of actually recovering money in many of those cases are not great because these are pirate. I mean, they're intentionally pirates. It's usually. a very good point. And also a lot of these um, importers are actually not even based in the United States. So it's more difficult to track them down. Even if you get a judgment, are you going to be able to not only collect, are you going to be able to find them? So getting the order from the ITC is a much more efficient way to achieve your ultimate objective, which is to stop the, you know, counterfeit goods from coming into the United States. So, um, so yeah, so let's see, I think we've, we've hit all the topics. So let's just kind of like do a quick summary. And then if there are questions, um, realize this is a lot more dense of a topic than we usually take on in these webinars, but we wanted to just talk about it, especially, you know, in the context of all of the, the imports and things that, you know, that we hear about every day. Right. Um, and, and Justin, people talk a lot about the border, especially nowadays. We're not going to get political here. Don't worry about that. Um, but people talk a lot about border protection when they're talking about um, people crossing the border. Here, we're just talking about the goods crossing the border. And this happens, I mean, there are hundreds of points of, of ports of entry into the United States. Um, people think about the traditional ones and, you know, Long Beach. They think about Mexico and Canada. And obviously, those are the main ports of entry. But um, the, this is something that can happen at, at really any point um, of entry into the United States. And um, certainly, you know, if you're going to be importing from the Port of Long Beach, this is something that has become a very sort of routine part of the process at CBP. And I think it um, is something that, that people really need to understand and know about if they are involved in the international uh, sale or, or purchase of goods. Yeah. So, so I guess just kind of summarize your, if you're importing goods, 
from overseas or if you if you're afraid that other people are importing knockoff goods that compete with yours because a lot of times it may be a u.s manufacturer and foreign imports are coming in um your first stop is to get a federal trademark registration and then once you've got that you take that federal trademark registration and you go over and record it with customs and border protection you pay your money you fill out the application and give them some information and then at that point um, you, you also start policing because you're also able to report things. If you see things in the marketplace that are infringing, you can report those to customs and border and, and that will help them identify infringing goods. So then you, you, you're, into, you're getting this relationship with, with CBP that will, um, allow them to identify and stop, stop those infringing goods before they get into the United States. So, um, let's see here. I, I think this is. Oh, go ahead, Sharon. No, no, I was just going to say, you know, another interesting topic, maybe for another day, is what happens if you're the importer and they seize your goods and it was a wrongful seizure and they're, you were authorized or they are not counterfeit goods. Um, I mean, you have to have some sort of... Uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole process in there. I mean, it's, it is a, once they start those forfeiture proceedings um, and even during that 30 days, the importer is given time to, to prove that it is actually um, real. So it is, it is a contested proceeding. It's not, um, you know, from the outside, it may look like it's and not. Can, but... And they can file a petition to get some sort of relief. But I think, you know, as you said, this is a very um, complicated topic. And Justin and I are available. If anyone thinks of any questions, if you want to send us an email, um, we are here to, um, to assist you with any of those questions. And we thank you very much for attending our uh, webinar today. Yeah, this is the first one we didn't, oh, we didn't have any questions submitted in the chat, um, which is surprising. So hopefully we have answered all of those, but please just reach out to us afterwards if, uh, if you have any questions. And again, I'm Justin McNaughton and Sharon Urias, and uh, we appreciate your time.